ask everybody to move forward. I know you're comfortable in your seats, but I want to make this as interactive as possible. So can I ask you, and if you don't, I will come and ask you personally. So please come forward. I make you honorary Money. president today. Okay, now everything I'm going to say today, because we've been cut from we've been cut from 90 minutes to an hour, so the time has been shrunk. But the good news is, anything you want to know is based on this book. Okay, it's called Angel Investing, and it's by David S. Rose. David is my mentor, and he's the founder of the New York Angels. And the New York Angels have done, well, I'm not going to know that, you'll find out. Trust me, you know, uh, there are very few angel networks in the world that have done as many angel deals as the New York Angels. So that's anything, you know, if you're not sure or you want more detail, this is what I am going to be jumping through. And hopefully, we will get to the end. And by the time, you know, we've got to that, then we'll be, uh, we'll be good to go. What I'm suggesting, given there's very few of us, so uh, to make it as interactive as possible, instead of waiting to the end to take questions, if you have a question, just stop me, ask the question, and let's move on. Okay? That way it makes it much easier for you, and you don't have to remember, what was I going to ask again? You know, or what was that? Um, can everybody understand me? Because I'm conscious, painfully conscious of the fact that I'm in Turkey and I'm even speaking either too fast or too funny. Are you okay, sir? Ma'am? Ma'am? You good? Sir? Ma'am? Sir? Excuse me, sir? You good? Fantastic. Now, did you give me a widget? No. Okay. So, in the absence of widgets, guess what? My book's going to be the partner. Let me put this here. Can I get one of these, please? OK, now, what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to go through the three main parts. OK, uh, excuse the content. It was done in a rush. It wasn't you know, totally finished. But you get a rough idea of how much material, okay, we've, uh, we've got to go through when you look at that. But th there are three, there's basics, and then we'll cover actually doing the, you know, the mechanics of angel investing, and finally, you know, exits and managing you know, uh, your portfolio, all right? So, um, let's, let's see if we can get on with it. Okay, so in terms of basics, why is anybody attracted to angel investing? Uh, somebody was asking me just yesterday, it says, how, what kind of percentage do angels make? I'll talk through that 25% or whether it's a bit for reality, you know, and some of the things surrounding it. So let's, let, let me just keep going. First part is, what exactly is angel investing? Angel investing actually comprises of three primary things. Cash being the cheapest of the three investments you will make. Okay? The, mo the second most expensive investment an angel makes is access to their personal network. Sir, do you want to come up from? Thank you. Bring me on the spot. <laughs> okay. Um, there are three key things an angel brings to the party. Cash, like I said, is the cheapest. The second most expensive thing an angel brings to the party is reputational risk by giving the startup access to their personal business networks. So I call it working the phones. You will find I spend a day to two days clear. Ma'am, please just come up front and have a seat. There's plenty of empty seats in the front. Sir, please do the same. There's one there. And there's one there. Fantastic. Uh, I call it working the phones. You're going to find out you spend a fair bit of time doing that. But why is it more expensive than cash? If I spend money, 
Okay? I've got assets working for me that I'm expecting money from. If I lose money, I've got other assets that can generate additional cash. Okay? That's, that's sort of how that works. But if I introduce somebody to you and they damage your business, then that's reputational risk. So that's why it's more expensive than money. The third and most expensive thing an angel brings is mentoring. And because that is based on hard-earned expertise you've acquired over the year and exposure and everything else, but more importantly, it is time. And time is not replaceable. Cash, you can replace. Reputation, you can repair. But guess what? Once you've spent the time, you can't go back. So that's why it is the most expensive, and that's really what angels do. All right, there are different types of angels, and in terms of who should and shouldn't be an angel, if you're risk averse, if you're not a people person, you don't enjoy hanging out with people, that is probably the wrong thing for you. Okay, and you can make your money in better ways or different ways, more suitable to you as a person. You must enjoy seeing people grow. Now, can you come up front, please? Thank you. Okay, you must enjoy seeing people grow and build. Those are fundamentals to angel investing. If it's not your thing, then yeah, you know, fine. Getting started, I'll talk a bit more about you know how you get started. It is fun, you know. Um, I get to advise on companies, run companies without actually you know being the CEO. I've done my bit as a CEO. I've built a couple of businesses. Interesting. Um, we sold one of the businesses uh, I was involved in about three and a half, four years ago for three and a half billion dollars. And I still remember, you know, the last day of the transaction, the principal on the other side who was buying still asking, are you guys sure you want to do this? Because he could see the passion. When you spent something like about 15, 18 years building a company, selling it is not easy. I trust you. It's like, for those of you who are mothers, the first day your child goes to school, I have to put that child in the hand of somebody else. You know, that's, that's really how it feels. But yeah, it, it can be fun. This time, you're not, you're not the dad, you know, you're just helping out, you know, um, kind of thing. There is also um, the joy of giving back, just seeing people glow, you know. Uh, I have a particular young man, I'll leave his name out. I remember the first time I met him, he was in a hub, okay. Um, this is nearly $50 million later, because he's raised, yeah, 10. He's raised about $50, $60 million since we met. And the difference between the young, shy young man in that hub who was in the, just like we're having this class now, he was, I still remember it was in the back corner, and just raised this to ask one question, and that's how I got, you know, notice of him. Today, you know, he's part of my syndicate as an investor, and he runs a company that just, Late last year, raised another $10 million for his new venture. So it's heartwarming from that standpoint, just seeing people grow. Now, this is, a, in terms of basics, this is the simple, fundamental truth, okay, of angel investing. Whether you like it or not, no matter what, sir, could you please come up? Could you move, move up front, yeah. Whether you like it or not, and no matter what you do, the reality is most startups, sir, could you join them up front? I'm sort of trying to populate the front, okay? Um, is that most startups fail, okay? And investing, we all know, is a numbers game. There's a big debate whether you need a minimum portfolio of 10, 20, or 30 but that you need a portfolio is without doubt. Why? Because typically, if you put money in 10, five of them will never return the money. You just won't get it back, all right? Of the remaining five, maybe two or three of them will give you your money back. So you put in $100, here's your $100 back, all right? Of the remaining three, one or two, okay, will give you what we call percentiles. 
So you put in $100, you get $150, which is 50% return. Or you get $175, which is, you know, 75% uh, return, which is not bad, right? Okay, but as an angel, what you're looking for is that one that will give you a multiple. Okay, so 3x, 4x, 5x. And why is that important? Because that single one has to give you the money back to cover what you lost with the other five. And those are the mathematics I'm not going to get into the details of. That's why I shared the book with you at the beginning that actually help you. Math, one more, one more, just one more. That's it. Perfect. Okay, that gets you there. All right? So the other key thing to remember is this. Uber, for example, has raised more money than you can shake a stick at, and they're still fundraising. 30 billion from the Saudis, and they're still fundraising. So companies will always need money. And you've got to mentally prepare yourself for that. And that's why we say invest with the end in mind. You've got to know how far am I prepared to go with any particular startup. Okay, this is something you sort of should always have in the your back pocket so you know where you fit. This is an ideal scenario. Not every startup goes through every stage. All right? I'm not saying every startup has to go from one step to the next step. You'll find there are startups where the founder has had enough money, he's invested himself, and the next thing you know, in fact, there's one missing, which is IPO. All right? I've seen companies that have gone from founder to a public offering. But typically, what will happen is the first person that puts in money is the person that's starting the company. All right? So as the founder, you put in money. Then the next thing, you look for family and friends. Please, Jubel, come up front, please, and sit. No, please, everybody, first two rows. That's why they're all sitting in the first two rows. We'll stop the class until you do. <laughs> Sorry, you were there to, to leave that place. Okay? Some will say these are the three F's, okay? Family founder of fools. Because that's that sort of how it happens. Then you find there are a lot of grants and competitions for startups, entrepreneurship competition, and so on. You know, you find that they win those. Then you have incubators and accelerators who are increasingly getting funding. Okay, that will put money in. Uh, as an angel investor, which is next, you want to be sure they've done one or more of these. Because if nobody else has put money in this idea, my question to you is going to be, why are you? Especially depending on where they are here. Because they start out, it's an idea. Then you build a sample or a prototype of it. You start getting customers. You grow. This is all early stage. And like I said, please, if you don't understand, just ask the question, or else I'll just keep going. All right? So those are, yes, ma'am. For example, if a company has been self-funded for a few years because the founders happen to have enough money, mm -hmm. and they go straight to the Mm -hmm. Would that be a no, that's what I said. I've seen people go from founder almost to Series A. It depends on what they need and what their profile is. Not everybody does have to go step by step by that. Nah, it doesn't. But these are the steps if you are taking one step. It's like climbing a staircase. You know, some people will go one step at a time, other people take two steps at a time. And then you have the athletes, they'll take three. Yes, sir. The sequence that you mentioned in your slide, that they start up dealing from founder or from family, this sequence is uh, uh, always uh, works for sometimes... We, uh, we look for... I, I, I know, I don't think I've ever invested in anybody personally that hasn't had the people around him invest. Okay, because if the people who know you don't trust you with their money, why should I? That's my question. 
so you mean uh, an angel uh, can invest in a startup uh, after acceleration uh, period? It, it doesn't always have to be that way. As an investor, I've invested in people that haven't been to accelerators. Okay, I've invested in people that have won competitions and people that haven't even been to competitions. I'm just saying these are the things you will typically find. Not every startup goes into everything. Okay? So you may find a startup that has started with an idea that they pitched to a competition and they won. And they used the money from the competition to build a prototype. It happened with uh, prep class. Okay, for example, in Nigeria, where they, they sold an idea, they won a British Council competition, he gave them 20 grand, and with the 20 grand, they got developers and everything, and then they built a prototype. Based on the prototype, they won to get into an incubator, and then from the incubator, you know. So it, it, um, the, the journey will differ depending on the startup. The last thing, uh, you consider the accelerator as an investor, so that's what I'm saying is, and how I can speak to this, because she runs an accelerator, accelerators are increasingly getting funds to invest. So for example, in my home country, Nigeria, we have the CC Hub. CC Hub has a $5 million fund, okay? It's a, it is, it is a, in fact, it's an incubator. It's not an accelerator. Excel Africa was an accelerator. I think they raised in excess of $100 million. So it depends. There's not one, it has to be a p particular way. If you go to CC Hub today, you can Google CC Hub, they'll give you $25,000 as a startup in Nigeria because they've got access to funds. They'll give you open workspace and everything else. It's just bring your idea and come work. Okay, so that's, that's sort of, remember I said we would cover just the basics. So. That's, that's sort of at a high level. You now understand the 25% annual return, okay? It's not on each, okay, uh, startup. Are you with me? It is on a portfolio. Because how many do you reckon will fail at the minimum? 50%. Okay, half your money, okay, will go. But the good news is you're looking for that one. Some say, oh, that's going to be the unicorn. I don't do unicorns, I do gazelles. That's a different conversation to have. But if you're not having fun, if it's not your personality type, if you don't enjoy being around people and boisterous and you know, uncertainty and all of that, then you probably want to avoid doing this, okay? And I've talked about the portfolio theory, where you need a portfolio. And we went through the financial life of a startup from founder, family, <coughs> friends, fools, all the way through to competition, incubators, and on to angel investors. From angel investors then to VCs, Series A, Series, you know, BCD, whatever, until you get to IPO and private equity. Okay, so those are the basics. Any questions about the basics? Everybody's happy, you already knew this. Nothing new there, right? Good. Now, we're going to look at the nuts and bolts. What does an angel investor really do? Okay? First, how you develop your deal flow, uh, why you're investing. It's a people investment, and that's why we talk I think, Remember yesterday, Bybars was talking about bet the jockey, not the horse. This is what he was referring to. I'll talk a bit about that. Um, pitching which has, because it's event driven, has become how people tend to look at this. But pitching is such a small part, but it's the big part, you know, when you look from the outside is, oh, has he pitched? When am I listening to a pitch? You know, it's like saying I'm gonna get married on a first date. It doesn't happen. All a pitch is is to get you interested. But I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, how you do due diligence, how you do valuation, um, the different types of investment rounds, because it's not just, oh, I put a, you know, a seed and, and quite a few others. We'll talk a bit about that. We'll talk about how to do a deal. Um, term sheets, very important, especially if you are looking ahead. 
you know, um, to other people coming in. Then what you do after the investment and then the whole concept of exit. Um, and of course, this mythical beast called a uni unicorn. Does everybody here know what a unicorn is? No, I don't mean the Silicon Valley definition. Exactly. Everybody does? The horse with the horn? That doesn't exist? Right. You smoke some of the good stuff. Sir? You start seeing it after you smoke some of the good stuff. Exactly. You know? Or you inhale some, you know, depending on you know what your poison is. Okay. How do you develop your deal flow? Because angel investing is about what? Investing, right? So where do you get? people to invest in. And there's a whole list there. First is ask your friends. Second, my favorite, angel groups. So my angel investment group meets once a month and we get anywhere from one to 10 pitches, depending on how many people the Secretariat has found. Okay, meetups, there are all kinds of meetups happening. Uh, if you're into the tech space, like in my case, London, London has an amazing amount of meetups. You spend your whole life doing nothing else. Same thing I hear about Istanbul and Porto and other cities are starting to grow that culture where there's regular stand-ups and what have you. Business plan competitions I just talked about, you'll find all the development partners and international people, they're doing competitions for startups all the time. Um, conferences like this one, there's just, is it next door? All over there, you know. Um, incubator, accelerator, demo days. Demo days are my favorite, simply because you know they've been through a process, somebody's kicked their tires, given them some training, and you can ask behind the scene questions. One of my favorite companies I put money in actually came through a demo day. Unfortunately, the young man that was leading that particular team passed away at 25 years old, so it's not such a good story to tell. I don't tend to rely on on online deal sources, even though I support you know, uh, and I'm an advisor to one of the biggest African online uh, deal sources uh, going today. What you tend to find there is people are afraid to put their information out. So you get to meet with them before you can get. So treat online deal sources just as a lead, but you're going to have to vet and do a lot of work, you know, if you're getting uh, deals from that. Um, and then their deal brokers, stay away from them. You shouldn't be paying anybody to find findings. Just avoid them. If somebody says, oh, I have 10 startups, give me five pounds. Sorry, mate. It's just not on. You do not want to go down that street, no matter what. All right? If it's for later stages, then that's a different thing. But for early stage and seed, which is what we're talking about, OK? And when you meet a founder, you are looking for chemistry. It's just that simple. You're looking for chemistry. It's like the same thing when you meet a new opposite sex person. Does this work? Does this chemistry work? You know, whether it's an associate for business or you know it's a girlfriend or boyfriend or you know, whatever it is, it's the same principles that apply when you meet a founder. Because if you imagine that you're gonna be with this person for a minimum of five years, all right, then it starts to set the perspective. If you walk away from that meeting feeling, well, I didn't like it, don't bother. Do not bother. There's enough deals out there for your money for you to walk away. Occasionally, you miss some things, but then, you know, you can't win them all. Right. I talked about buy bars yesterday, saying, you know, it's, it's actually, not the business they're building, but the team that is building the business. That is important. How many people here know what a pivot is? A pivot. Okay, right. So that should tell you everything. A pivot, for those of you who don't know, is when a company changes direction or product to get, because when a company starts, the very first thing a company is looking for is something we call product market fit. Okay, what are the features or what are the things I'm going to build into this 
product service offering that the market is going to want to have it or must have it as we now talk about because you don't want to create something they just want you want something they must have that's new you know um, so it's like oh i want an apple i watch or you know i've got to have these new Gucci shoes or whatever must haves and that's called product market fit understanding your customer base and it's it's in that you find that the company itself will change function features and form but the individuals behind it must have the capability to do that and that's why we talk about you better job in our course and what makes a great entrepreneur vision flexibility and the ability to inspire that's my take there are others who will tell you different but it, you know, it's like, ah, he must be a good technical developer, he must be a good marketer, you know, nah. If that entrepreneur is not a people person, in the 21st century, he ain't going nowhere. Okay. Uh, are startups a young person's game? No. All right. Uh, David, I showed you his book. That all right again, for those of you who weren't here, this course is based on this book, okay, by David Head, S. Rose. It's called Angel Investing, all right? Um, his dad, his father, okay, you can imagine David and I are about to say roughly the same age, so they his um, His dad was still an entrepreneur. I guess where? In Ghana. From New York, he's doing new work. So the age factor, and how young? Well, I think if I, you know, the last I heard, the youngest entrepreneur that the New York Angels put money in was 16 years old. I mean, you know, he had around him, all the people around him were, had an average age of something like 26, but he was the team lead. So age is not the issue, definitely not. Serial entrepreneurs versus first timers are bet on a serial entrepreneur any day. Any day. Show me how much you've lost and tell me what you've learned from losing that. Much, much cheaper than an MBA. Tech savvy. Tech savvy is a tough one. Um, I believe they should be technology literate and technology aware and technology appreciated. Okay? But for them to be the developers that understand that, oh, there's that code missing, or I write Ruby on Rails and everything else, that's paid help. Okay? You can always buy those skills in or partner them in. The key thing is, can this person inspire a team and are they flexible enough over a period of time to deliver? Education to me is fundamental. I don't say you have to have a university degree, but it helps. Um, why education is important is because it allows you to articulate your vision as you inspire others to deliver it. If you do not have that capacity, then it's going to be a tough one. And this is not always about formal education. And somebody pointed out to me when I was doing one of these classes, but yeah, you know, it's important. It's interesting you talk about education being important. But last I checked, Bill Gates didn't graduate. Neither did Mark Zuckerberg. And I said, well, excuse me, uh, but they did. He says, no, they didn't. I said, yes, they did. He says, no, 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 they didn't. Bill Gates left Harvard when he was in, and he knew the exact day. Man, Zuckerberg left Harvard in and he did that. I said, well, the American education system is so good that it is shoulders above most of what we consider education. High school graduation in America, unfortunately, is the equivalent of a lot of degree courses around the rest of the world. So when I talk about education, I'm not talking about they have to have a master's or a PhD or a you know, I'm talking of the ability to continuously learn for the rest of their lives. To me, that's education. 
if you have the capacity to go on YouTube and become an expert in something overnight, that's, that means you're educated. But if you don't even know how to access YouTube, let alone know where to find what you're looking for, I worry. Okay, so that's, that's, that's on education. Signs of a weak founder, accepting anything and everything. I worry when somebody keeps saying yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, and I don't get any pushback, not interested. But when a father says, yes, I understand what you're saying, what you're asking us to do A, B, C, D, and F, however, for the following reasons, we're not going to be able to do that because this is the alternative we're choosing. That's the kind of founder you're looking for. But anybody you can push around, if you can push them around, guess what? Somebody else can push them around. And all of where you're going to be there. You've charted a path saying, you know, we're going to the back of the room. And then somebody says, oh no, have a seat and have a chat with me for a minute. And they say, okay, yes, let me. You've missed the back of the room. I did say the pitch is the most overrated component of, a, of an angel's life. But don't underestimate its value. In a pitch, there are some fundamentals you need to look. Oh, by the way, for those of you taking pictures, stop, 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 stop. Don't worry yourself about it. All right? If you want this, just go online. My name is Tony Davis. Go to SlideShare. That's where I got this from. It's in public but domain. You, but you didn't make it. Sorry? But you didn't make it. I didn't make it. It sounds like you took it from somebody. Oh, no. Uh, I was clarifying that. Uh, this is your presentation. This is, oh, this is my presentation. <laughs> Sorry, yes. I just made it public. Okay, because I, I do this introduction course quite a number of times in different places, and each time they say, oh, do you have one of these with your slides on it, or did you bring your own laptop, or so I just tell everybody, just get internet access, okay, for the screen, and we're good. So because of that, if you go to SlideShare, uh, my handle online is T-O-M-I-D-E-E. -E. T -O -M -I -D -E -E. If you go to SlideShare, Tommy D, if you look for Introduction to Angel Investing, you'll find it there. There's a, there's a whole bunch of other slides you might also find interesting. You know, that, they're all up there in public domain. Sir? Is it downloadable? Yeah, yeah, you can download it. You can do anything you want with it, you know. Um, yeah, knock yourself out. Yes, sir? T-O-M-I, my first name, D-E-E. -E. Yeah, that's my nickname. Okay, so that it, it's available for you, so you don't have to keep taking, you know, uh, the pictures and clog up your phone with all this material. When you're ready for it, just go online again. Okay, now what are you looking for in a pitch? The first thing you're looking for in a pitch. Remember, I told you this is a what game? It's a people's game. Angel investing is a people game. It's all about people. In my case, my portfolio. Is here, it's on WhatsApp. All right? I have a live portfolio of 16 companies right now. They're all on WhatsApp. This is how I talk to my CEOs and their teams. It's a people game. So the first thing you're looking for is the strength of the management team. When we say strength of the management team, have they worked together before? How long have they been together? What have they done before together? Have they failed together before? How did they recover from failure? What did they learn? Okay. What are the synergies? Or are you looking at a team of four and all of them are programmers? Are you with me? So that's the first thing you're looking for is, who are these people that want to take my money? If it's one person, you might have a slight issue. There, yes, there should be a leader, but the leader must have inspired the team. If you can't inspire others to follow you, then it's going to be a bit difficult. And that's what you're looking for in the management team. The second is the size of the opportunity. How big is this thing? How big could it get? Because nobody ever really knows how big anything is. So this is the art of the possible. Oh, it's a market of this. It's, you know, can you imagine somebody trying to explain the potential of WhatsApp 10 years ago 
when Blackberry was the king. She says, oh, we're going to build something, and it's going to be Blackberry. And I'm going to look at it and say, you, you're going to do what? Blackberry. Do you know how big Blackberry is? They, you know, they're the corporate kings of email. Because you'd be thinking about corporate email and that market because it's the only thing we know. That's why I say when you look at, especially the size of the opportunity, take a leap of faith. But be sure you, you know, that there's at least something you're hanging your hat on. Okay? The next thing is the product or service itself. Who wants it? Why do they want it? You know, what are they going to do with it? What are they doing with it now? Etc. 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 I have a framework called Poem that I use myself. If you go onto my slide share, you'll find it. You're welcome to use it. It just gives you a quick way of assessing, okay, uh, pitches. What are they going to do with the money? If they're going to use your money for working capital, you might want to think twice. If they're using it for market expansion, you know, or they're using it for new product development, then yeah, you know, you can see that you, you're expecting that bleep on their revenue curve. If the money you're putting in is not going to result in a revenue gain, think about it twice. Okay? So what do you mean this, this, this is, uh, I don't understand this. Part of your investment will be for working capital. No, no, not not fungible working capital. If you're going to use my money for salaries, I'm not going to give it. That's interesting. Okay. What, a, what about uh, inventory? Sorry? What about inventory? Most of the capital goes to work. Oh, inventory is revenue gain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inventory carries margin. That's, okay. that's, so, uh, uh, let, me qualify, let, me, let me qualify that. Okay, because I just had a chance to think about it. Again, let me qualify it. If it is a capacity that is going to result in revenue gain. So for example, I had a team, they were in tech ed, all right? They were in technology education. What they were doing was they were gathering historical exams and getting teachers to curate the answers to the exams so the students would have, you know, be able to do crib notes kind of thing. All right, fantastic. They had teachers on board. All right, they themselves had been students, but they didn't have anybody that could write a particular type of program this year. Okay, so they were looking for money to be able to hire that person. And that's still revenue. <coughs> All right, what I'm saying is the salary for the four of you, the four of you have been in business for about a year and you're going broke, you're not making traction in the market, and you're not going to seek one so you can pay yourself salaries. That's what I was reacting to. Does that help? Yep. You okay. All right. So during the pitch process, expect written documents you can walk away with. They'll give you more detail than you can hear, just like I've given you now. Um, and uh, at least a summary of the financials. Okay. So you should be able to leave with an appreciation of this, these are what the numbers look like. They're asking me for 50,000. They're currently making 300,000 300, a month. They're spending about 250. There's a shortfall. You know, be familiar. That you should be able to walk away feeling, okay, I get the picture. If you don't, then the pitch has failed. Because the purpose of a pitch is just to attract you. That's it. Attract you to do what? To do this, to look under the hood and lead a deal. All right. So when we say looking under the hood, there are three aspects to what that word everybody said: D -D 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 due diligence. Okay. There are three aspects to it. The first is pretty much what we've been talking around, talking about, which is commercial due diligence. What are the commercial parts of this business, all right? And when we say commercial, who's the customer? Why are they buying? How many of them potentially can you have? How big is the market? What's the competition like? Who are the regulators? Is it, you know, what licenses are required? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get it. That's commercial due diligence. And you as an angel have first responsibility for commercial due diligence. In fact, in, in our network, we do not outsource commercial due diligence. 
please come forward. I know you're, you're just coming in, but please move forward. You're in for the next one, right? No, no, no. no. For introduction, in which case, join us. Come on, come on. Come front. No, no. no please no. do not. No, I'm serious. <laughs> Thank you. Much better. It's nicer and tighter, you know, it makes it easier. Also, just so you're aware, in case you're wondering what am I saying, come forward. It makes it easier to be able to see everybody. And um, being a lecturer or a teacher or a trainer, whatever you want to call it, the feedback comes from your eyes. So when I see something like that, I know, oh, additional information required. When I see that, it means get it. Don't be able to move on. You know, we understand. So that's why the closer you are, the easier it is for me to be able to deliver. Does that help? Okay? So, the three parts of due diligence. First is the commercial. Do not, it's your responsibility as an angel to understand the commercial environment in which this startup is functioning. That's where your money is going. Remembering as an angel, what you're trying to do is create an asset that yields you a return. It's about your money working for you. Okay? Other people are working for their money, but this is about you putting money in, so okay, go to work and come back to you. At worst, in percentiles, but I give you what I was looking for. Can anybody remember? Sure? Thank you. Did you hear that? What are we looking for? Multiples. Multiples. As an angel, I'm not a VC. I'm not a private equity person looking for percentage return. I'm looking for multiples. I want to put in 100 and get either 400, 500, or 600. I'm not looking, I don't want to put in 100 and get 110, or 150, or 160. I want to put in 100, and I'm looking and saying, can this thing give me 1,000? That's a 10x return. All right? And just to bring it to life, in case you're wondering, this is, there's a company, you can go Google it, it's called Super Strikers. 17 years ago, I put in $5,000, right? Eight years ago, I walked away with 250000 and I still own 5% of the company. That's what we're talking about here. What do they do? Sorry? It's a fantasy league football uh, character set. It does comics and animation. It's on Disney. Today it's the first African property ever on Disney. Okay? Oh, and by the way, Black Panther is not an African property. Just so, let's get that straight. All right, now, so commercial is the first. Legal, get those who know. Get a lawyer to do legal due diligence for you. All right? I personally don't, in, I don't invest in anything that is not incorporated. I'm always looking for somebody, who, you know, a company that's already incorporated with the board of directors and all the legal tie-ups. So doing legal due diligence becomes much easier. Who are the shareholders of the company? Who own it? You know, um, is it properly registered? Are all the licenses in place, etc., etc. That's the lawyer's job to do legal due diligence. But if a company has passed that stage, so they could if a company is already registered and has passed that early stage, mm -hmm. they might not be willing to accept it. They might, they might then, then I don't, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. So they belong to DC. But the people that will take that <coughs> I deal with, I'm speaking again to my, I, I only Your have, experience. I only have 15 years experience doing this, so it's not a lot. There are people with more, and I only have a small portfolio of 16 companies. Okay, there are people with 40 and 50, you know, people like Paolo, and others. So, and most of my portfolio is in, in Africa. So that's the context, just so you're aware. All right? Those are the disclaimers. The, the, you know, when you get the little fit, fine print at the bottom, to say, these are the fine prints of things, you know. Uh, so, again, it varies. So if you look, for example, to answer your question, sir, if you look at what we call ticket sizes, as an example, the average ticket size here in Europe for an angel investor, I think is what fifty to hundred thousand dollars. For us, it's about twenty-five to fifty. We'll go to hundred. We'll do two fifty. But those are big deals, and they're syndicated and aggregated deals. 
as opposed to a single investor putting in a hundred. So but the, the scale is different. Okay. What would be the yeah. What would be the, the minimum ticket for you to outsource and the diligence because it can be cost? Well, I'm going to come to that. Keep that question. If I don't answer it before we finish, I'm going to come to that. All right? Because there's an approach you must take to angel investing that allows you to do this. It's called belonging to a syndicate or a network. That's the answer. You don't do it by yourself. Okay? Angels hunt in packs. That's, that's, but I'll, I'll, I'll address that. Um, financial due diligence also, I call them spreadsheet jockeys. Uh, we have people, you know, who will build a model on just about anything. Just give them the numbers, you talk it with them. Uh, in Lagos, we have uh, an amazing team. Uh, they will crunch numbers within 36 hours of just about, I don't, I don't care what you're doing. They have a set of like about 30, 40 questions. We put it to you and you just give them those numbers, they come up with the model. But I'm not saying that's the way to go, but I'm saying you need to do financial due diligence to be comfortable that yes, your money will come back to you, okay, your multiples. If I don't see a potential for a 10x return in five years, the chances that I'm gonna risk my money are near zero. That's, but that's my philosophy, okay? Then leading a deal, <coughs> we'll talk a bit about term sheets. Leading a deal implies that there are others. And that is what we really, really recommend. And you need to consider that. So don't always think, oh, these guys need 100,000. You know, I don't have 100,000. I'm leading a particular deal as I speak now. They're trying to raise half a million dollars. Of the half a million dollars, I think I've got maybe about 15. But I know we're going to do the deal. Okay? So that's what we're talking about here in terms of angel investing. Don't, don't always think, oh, I have to be the angel investor and it's me and then there's a company. No. You will lead just like you're dealing with the CEO who you expect to have a team around him. Okay? You are also going to be leading or being part of, okay, an investment group that is in a particular deal. Yes, this is my favorite part because valuations. There are four simple numbers you need to know. The first, what is the value of the company before you invest? What is the value of the company after you invest? The difference being your investment, okay? What are you expecting? Remember I told you five years out or seven years out, you've got to begin with the end in mind. Oh, I'm gonna, you know, I think I can keep my money with these guys for five years, three years, 10 years, whatever. What do you expect the value of the company to be then? The difference between the value of the company then and the value of the company now and the years in between will tell you, remember that 25% mythical rate we were talking about? It will tell you whether or not it's possible. And this is what I keep telling people is, if you're overvalued today, a clear eight out of 10 CEOs, startup CEOs that I meet overvalue their company because they don't understand this. If you value your company at 100 million today, think about it, it would have to be at a billion dollars 10 years from now for me to get my rate of return. How many billion dollar companies are there on the African continent? And then they look at me and say, oh, so you're gonna be the first one? And I have at least three or four CEOs that I've been tracking for two years on this particular topic. And each year, I go back and say, so how, what's your valuation this year? Three of them, the valuation has dropped. One guy is still sticking to his guns. Yes, sir? Correct. 
That's what I was talking about earlier. You need to understand the market context. That's what I meant by how would you have valued WhatsApp when it started? And at that point in time, um, Blackberry was the dominant force. It's not the same market. WhatsApp is not in the same market with Blackberry. Exactly. Exactly. And that is why you need, you know, it, it's an art, it's not a science. It's the first thing you need to know about valuation. And they're different, I teach a course on valuation, and they're different ways, you know, from internal rate of return, future cash flows, you know, um, market, you know, sim similar markets, etc. There's a whole bunch of methods to arrive at, you know, what the valuation is. But for somebody starting out, this is a starter's course, okay? This is a, a beginner's, this is an introduction. The first thing is, how much is the value today? I'm going to keep my money with you for five years. What will be the value in five years? So that difference divided by five tells you, yeah, realistically, what you can expect back if you put money in. OK? <clears throat> now, how much should you invest? Well, what we say is this. Angel investing should be no more than 10% of your investment portfolio. I repeat, angel investment should be no more than 10% of your investment portfolio. If you don't have an investment portfolio, you shouldn't even be an angel investor. That's why in Africa, I'm the president of the Africa Business Angels Network, I say, if, you know, for you to be an angel investor, be a landlord first. Because in Africa, we love property as an investment. If you've already got your own house and you've got tenants, then you can start to look at angel investing because you've already got an asset that is working on your behalf. But if you don't have other assets working on your behalf, it's probably not wise to go into this because it's time consuming, takes a fair bit of money, and yeah, the risk is the highest known in terms of any asset class. Having said that, the rewards are phenomenal. Too, but yeah. Okay, so I think I've covered this. Um, initial, uh, th this was the this, this particular question is the one I was speaking to. The higher your initial valuation, the rougher the ride is going to be. Because you may buy into the fact that, oh yeah, you think you're worth $3 million today. But the next investor comes and he's saying, sorry guy, you're worth $3 million. But this is 10 years later. Can everybody see you've lost money? Okay. Um, if, uh, is there any issue with the early stage investors, angels, uh, taking uh, too much of a stake, for example, 35, 40%? Sorry? Sure. If an angel investor, for example, takes a large stake at the beginning, like 35 percent, 35 percent? That's not angel investing. Then you go to 25. It is a lot. Yeah. Um, because we see what have issue with investing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Just here's the easier, easier way to think about it. Okay. Then everybody understands what dilution is. All right. If you're taking over 25% of a company, how much are you leaving for the founders of the company? 75. Sorry? 75% maximum. Exactly. So what happens to the employees? <coughs> what happens to future investors? That means you, you're going to keep going on a dilution curve. All right? That's why, as a rule, also, you don't want to be, you know, in the driver's seat or have a controlling, you know, controlling influence unless it is an expertise you possess. And for you to possess that expertise, that means you've built a company that is similar or is in that space and you know the industry like the back of your hand and you believe you can add value, in which case I'd be saying sit on the board as an, you know, as a non-exec. Yes, sir. On average of 60 companies you invested in, 
uh, what percentage of uh, companies uh, you receive your return for your investment? Sorry? What percentage did you get your return for investment? Oh, I thought that at the beginning, it was roughly about 25% a year. So it's about roughly 25% return. Those 16 are the ones that are active. I've had maybe about 15, 20 of them have died where I've lost all my money. And that's how I even got into this, was I made a whole bunch of money, okay, and then I did the investments and I lost like about 200 grand. It just went within an 18 month period. Right. When you are negotiating with the entrepreneur, there are certain fundamentals you are looking for. Without them, your chances of success diminish. The first I call the three I's. Integrity, integrity, and integrity. If the founder does not have integrity, okay, they look at you, as it is now, they say good evening. You know, this is still morning. That's a lack of, sir, please come forward. That's a lack of integrity. It's the first thing you're looking for. The second is knowledge. I once listened to a pitch and this guy was going to change the whole fashion world. And I asked him, you know, do you know what a thread of beauty is? He says, no, I wouldn't use it. The point I'm trying to make is, if they don't know the industry they're trying to disrupt, what chance do they stand? At least have an understanding of the industry. Yes, technology is amazing, it's fantastic, but it is still applied as an enabler in industry. They're looking for personal style of the individual. We all have different styles. So you're not saying it has to be this way, that way, that way. Remember what I said earlier? The first thing is the chemistry between the two of you. But any leader that does not have the ability to inspire the team, chances are they're not going to get through the sticky patches. And they have to be emotionally intelligent themselves and understand how to manage. So, the person that's saying, you know, you say, oh, sit down, and he says, yes, sir. Stand up, yes, sir. Sit down, no, sir, I'm quite comfortable standing, do you mind? Those are the kind of people you're looking for. Somebody who is assertive without being aggressive. But the most fundamental thing, like I said, outside of integrity and knowledge, is your personal chemistry. Because once you hand your money to that individual, guess what? You're going to have to deal with them till you exit. And if that doesn't work, hmm. We'll talk about term sheets in a minute. And there are two aspects to term sheets, which you, want, you both are around that you need to understand, OK? Uh, the economic uh, outcomes of the transaction and the control outcome of the, uh, of the deal. But you also need to understand how this person deals with control. Because just by your nature as an angel, you are going to be a driving force to them. That's why you're there. Remember I said there are three things an angel brings. Can you remember the three? What's the first one? Cash. Right? That's the cheapest one. Hmm? What's the second? Reputational exactly. Reputational risk because of access to their work. And the final one? Exposure to your expertise through mentoring. That question of control is going to be important. Is this somebody that's going to pick up the phone and call you when they need you? Or is this somebody you're going to have to chase? I've had both. I can tell you how many. We're in the process now of changing a particular CEO. I saw the red sign, red flags, about 11, 12 months ago. He'd just go quiet. No work. You're supposed to do monthly reports. Where's my monthly report? Oh, it'll be, it'll be with you. It'll be with three months later. I didn't get January. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Red flag. 
and it starts right from when you're negotiating the deal. Term sheets. There are different types of investment deals. You can invest equity or you can invest debt. Increasingly, the sexy one, especially for us in Africa, is what we call convertible notes, simply because, you remember I told you I lost all that money, right? Because I was doing equity deals. And you know what was happening? The startups were treating it like grants. You know, oh, I got the money. I don't have to pay back for five years. That's it, Papa. I see you in five years. Uh, but you're supposed to remain. Uh, sorry, sir. Then you get them here. Yeah, the nice one, that is good. Well, I'm sorry to go out to the other one. We're going to have to close down because we only got five customers after we put the program down. Oh, what happened to the intellectual call? We didn't register. There's a gentleman that's now saying he registered. We start to get the so the term sheets cover a whole host of things. That are, the term sheets, by the way, are not binding, but they lay out what the agreement between you and the startup is going to be like. So, do I get to see what you, sir? It's like a memorandum of understanding. Exactly. It is a memorandum of understanding, except you know we've taken the silicon value of term sheets because it lays out the terms by which the agreement will be done, yeah, will, will be written by, you know, by the, uh, by the lawyers. So you'll find invariably, it'll cover sort of the context. This is XYZ company, they're looking to raise this kind of money, and this is what they're going to use the money for. Then it'll cover sort of the economic terms, which is, I'm going to give you 300,000 and for that I'm going to own 10% of your company and uh, this is what will happen when the liquidity, this is what a liquidity event is, it's when somebody else puts in more than this, etc, etc. So those are the terms to do with money. This is for, you know, that, that's what we mean by the economic parts of the term sheet. And then you have the control parts of the term sheet which says you can't do this unless you ask me, you can't do that unless this happens. This has to go to the board, you must do this, you must do that, and during the life, these are the things that will happen. And then finally, you have the general terms, which says, these are the laws we're under, we're operating under the laws of Turkey, or under the laws of the European Union, etc., etc. And that's, that's the construct of the term sheet. Okay, there are samples out. Today, the one that's sort of making waves and people are liking is something called SAFE, which was put out by Y Combinator. It's a simple agreement for equity, is what SAFE stands for, and a lot of people are using it, okay? I personally think it's investor hostile, so, you know, I stay clear of it. All right? Um, convertible preferred stock is something that is happening in America, which uh, some of the angel investors seem to like. The concept of preferred means when there's a liquidity event, guess who gets their money first? Anybody knows? The person with the preferred stock. That's why it's preferred. Okay? Common stock stays with, you know, they get theirs last. But then there are all kinds of technicalities in there in terms of how do you now divvy up the last part and so on. Um, again, that's why I shared the book with you. There's a lot of detail in the book. You know, uh, please feel free to. What we're hoping to do, and I hope I haven't run out of time yet. Please, somebody who's time checking me. I'm good. No, no, no. Huh? I'm good? You can continue, yes. Sorry? It's 12.30, but... It's 12.30. Oh, okay. Let me, let me go. All right. Because um, we're nearly there, and I'll come to that. Uh, I, I can see you have a question. Um, after the investment, of course, you then write the agreement, whether it's a shareholder's agreement or it's a note purchase agreement. If it's, if it's equity, you get a shareholder's agreement. If it's a convertible note or any type of debt instruments, then they're issuing you notes. You get a note purchase agreement. You sign that, they draw down the money. You know, they're good to go. You need to monitor the company and be sure they're doing what it is they said they will do. Okay? And you have to consider a portfolio of companies as an angel investor. It's not about a single one. Because of the high failure rate of startups, you need a portfolio 
but each startup that comes into your portfolio must meet your criteria. And in my case, if I can't see a 10X, I'm not gonna do the deal. I don't do non-tech deals. There are a lot of beautiful uh, Greek you know, deals that are coming in. I'm seeing a lot of FinTech. Okay, I'm yet to do a FinTech deal. I'm coming an orange. Um, and I've been studying for the last two and a half years now, looking at blockchain, Bitcoin, crypto, social, you know, all aspects. Probably next year I will do one. But I don't feel I know enough yet, you know, to be an active angel in that particular space. Every investment I have ever done has required a follow-on within a three-year period, max. So. The rule of thumb is, if you have half a million dollars to invest, split it into two, all right? Maybe even three, give up. Please come up front unless you're for the next one. If you're for this, please come front. And what you want to do is hold on for the follow-on round. That way, you avoid dilution and you keep your 20%. And that's how it's done. Okay, because if you give them all the money up front and you go to 50%, the next round, you're not able to participate, you know, and so on. Um, adding value is critical. That's why you're an angel. If all they wanted is cash, then, you know, there are many money markets. Um, you, everybody's seen what's happening with ICOs now, crowdfunding, and so on and so forth. So access to cash is becoming less and less of an issue for startups. All right? So the cheapest part, you can even outsource. And I'm, I'm actively looking at that to say, OK, can I even get to where I'm an angel investor? Um, I read somewhere, or I saw somewhere yesterday, somebody was talking about um, crypto angel investors. Crypto angel investors. And you, you all saw that. I'm curious. Now I'm going to have a chat with you. But imagine a situation where what you're actually bringing to the party, in addition to your expertise and your network, is that pre-aggregated capacity to develop, to deliver cash. So the emphasis on the focus is not on the cash, but it's more on the advice and the guidance, you know, and the network you have. And that's the value that ignites the revenue return to give you the most <coughs> you're looking for. Seven on the company of a board, you need to consider this from this perspective. If a company goes bust and you're on the board, guess what? When I go do a search on you, I'm like, oh, you've had four companies that have gone bust. Are you, are you sure you want to be on that startup board? Food for thought. But if 50% of all angel companies you invest in fail, mm -hmm. so you're already batting for half. If you're on the board. That's what I'm saying. I will not take a board seat unless I believe I can add value and give guidance. So when you consider the board seat, you know, don't think it's a right and it's something you must do because you put money in and everything. There may be better people than you and other investors who have expertise in the market, who understand product market fit, who know how to generate traction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and are better placed than you to be on that board. Now, when a company fails, you have something to call a fire sale. I'm going through one right now, all right? And then you get pennies on the dollar. Oh, I'm sorry you put in 20 grand. Here's your two grand back. That's 10 cents on the dollar. That's if they're being nice. Some would just say there's even nothing to sell, except the intellectual property we registered, and then we have to find somebody who buy it and put it inside their, uh, yeah, inside their company. So, but the critical thing is you have to think of this right from the beginning. When you're writing the term sheet, should these things not work out, how are we going to divvy up the assets that are being acquired by the company? You need to think it through because it will be a reality five out of 10 times, no matter how good you are. That's what Silicon, Silicon Valley, I think, is what? Three and a half to five percent success rate? All right, that's why it's high risk. And when a company is acquired, which is called a liquidity event, the question then becomes, what do you get? How do you get it? What happens you know, to the shares or to your equity and so on and so forth? These are things to think about. 
you know, have the discussion and be sure you know how it all works. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it useful. If you have any more questions, please announce the time. I said you want to answer emails. Sir? Will you answer emails? Uh, I live on Twitter. Uh, this this is our, by the way, sorry, this is my network. Okay. I gave you my my social handle earlier on, T O M I D W E. So at Tommy D is on Twitter, at Tommy D on wherever it is you want, you will find me, you will find that my digital fingerprints are scattered all over the internet. Thank you. It's the I am a consultant and um, I am a consultant and I work with founders and I work with a company in Italy. And I have a fantastic uh, business model, but I have a problem with uh, founders and how reliable they are. Even though they, from a business point of view, they implement everything and they can do it. But as you mentioned before, they are very. Uh, Sometimes they didn't hear or they don't report information that should be reported in them, which is a bad sign. Is there any way of mentoring or coaching someone to increase a uh, if reliability? That's why the first thing you look at, remember earlier I said, when you meet, when you meet an event, you, you have to look how coachable are these people, how open are they? suggestions about themselves. I've had situations where I've actually had to bring in a personal brand friend to tell a founder, don't dress this way, you can't wear slippers, you know, flip-flops into board meetings. Okay, it doesn't speak well of you. Forget about you. If you are now your company, you represent you should get to clear those. So, you know, the young man uh, I was telling you about that didn't do any reporting, he was a medical doctor. His partner was a lawyer. So it wasn't they were not illiterate, it was just their personality style. And those are things that can be coached. And that's why we're going through a transition now, for example. Yeah. So again, yeah, that's that's the that's the role of the agent. Is to sit them down and have a face-to-face, -face, honest open discussion, and be factual, don't don't be emotional about it. Here are the facts, you're supposed to draw the team you didn't need to this, yeah, this happened, this happened, <coughs> Okay. Once they accept the facts, all right, you're onto something. The next is this is what I think those facts mean. That's the analysis. That's totally different from the facts. The analysis are subjective. I think you didn't do this because you were this or this happened that happened. They can debate that and you can have a healthy discussion. Then the third part is okay as a result of this analysis, what are the things we're now going to put in place? to make sure that these facts are not being implemented. So that helps. Yes. Thank you very much. Really good to see you. My pleasure. I learned a lot. I'm glad. OK. Yes, sir. What's your approach to initial evaluation of the company? Sir? Initial evaluation of the company. For example, if you're dealing with startup, I guess because the partnership could be completely That's what the general was saying earlier. You have to have a base set assumption, base set of assumptions. Okay, well, what assumptions, are your assumptions? The, the base set of assumptions have to come, they have to start from the industry of market. The United Nations, there's a whole, I don't care what country you're in, there are always a set of forecasts for that industry. Okay? So for example, I know absolutely nothing about medical devices in Turkey. But I know for a fact that the United Nations would have given a forecast of this is how the medical instruments market in Turkey will operate. The Turkish government, because they have to collect taxes on that industry, will have a forecast 2018, this is what will happen, etc. So that's the point of departure, is to start with those. So once you know this is what the market is, the question then becomes, who are the competitors? And what are their market shares? And what are their dynamics? You get it. You don't tend to evaluate market share. Well, you don't ask when you don't have anything else to go on. All right? So they have no revenue that you can extrapolate. They don't have existing customers that you can tap and ask. Are you with me? So it's all of those you start with. And then you get a whole pocket and say, okay, well, maybe in five years they can get 
0.5% market share, what would that number look like? Okay, that's the number. Now, how many products? What's the, what's the average product price? Okay, or the average service price? How many transactions? What kind of company would I have to build to get this number? And then you start to play around with those using assumptions. And that's where the spreadsheet junkies come in. I give up all of that, and they come back and say, you need 16.3 employees doing an average, da, 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 and then you need this margin and that margin. And you look at it, again, you look, go and look back. I've looked at sometimes, every once in a while, I've got to look back. You look back, none of these numbers are ever accurate. You're lucky if you get up to 60% accuracy. That, that is an amazing, maybe any other is amazing. But it's not the numbers. It is the process of thinking it through together. Okay? That is important. So don't get too enamored or too locked up in. Oh, it has to be said. No, 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 no. It's the fact that both of you agree that customers that drive between 9 o'clock and 8 o'clock are important for this product. The fact that that competitor is the big one you have to watch out for. The fact that, you know, uh, that government legislation that is pending might be important. It is those things that you discover through that assumption development process that makes it important. Okay, does that help? Yeah. Any other questions? Please have a great lunch. Bye.